There was a medieval wood preservation method so potent, so brutally effective, that later governments tried to restrict the materials behind it, not because it failed, but because it worked too well. A technique born from raw necessity, battlefield pragmatism, naval engineering, and the survival instincts of people who didn't have the luxury of, well, optional durability. This wasn't some mystical secret tucked away in an alchemist's notebook. It was rugged, practical chemistry that any villager, shipwright, or frontier builder could apply. And its results were so impressive that even centuries later, archaeologists still find structures preserved by it that refuse to rot, crumble, or surrender to the usual enemies of time. Let's dive straight into the craft, because honestly, history lovers and survivalists don't need fluff. They want the logic, the chemistry, the hard-earned wisdom. Understanding why medieval builders trusted fire as their first weapon against decay. The medieval engineering mindset revolved around taking limited materials and making them last longer than they had any right to. Wood was life. Shelter, transport, weaponry, food storage, agriculture, and losing wood to insects or decay wasn't an inconvenience. It was a threat. That's why early craftspeople developed a love-hate relationship with fire. They learned fast that heat transforms wood at a molecular level. You can see it in spear tips dug from battlefields or campsites, burned, hardened, and still intact centuries later. But fire alone wasn't the masterpiece. It was only the doorway. Controlled charring opened the pores of the timber. The surface darkened, the cell walls tightened, and the outer layer became naturally resistant to decay. This step made the wood thirsty, ready to absorb something thicker, more powerful, and far more permanent. How tar became the medieval world's secret super-preservative is, well, a story worth telling. The moment medieval communities paired fire-hardened timber with natural pine tar, they created one of the most effective organic preservation methods humankind has ever used. Tar saturation wasn't just improvisation, you know. It was a perfected craft. Scandinavian shipbuilders used it as part of standard maintenance, and village carpenters treated waterline beams, well frames, barn posts, and bridge planks. Stave churches, some surviving more than 800 years, owe their endurance not to miracles, but to tar. So, why tar? Because tar does three things better than most modern treatments, honestly. It blocks oxygen, it seals out water, and it suffocates anything that dares to eat the wood. The char layer protects the tar, and the tar protects the wood. Together they form a barrier so stubborn that insects, fungi, and moisture struggle to gain any foothold at all. And for centuries this technique became a backbone of civilization across the north and the heart of Europe. So, why did governments eventually clamp down on the materials behind the method? Well, here's the twist that makes history buffs, you know, really lean in. The method didn't become restricted because it was hazardous to people. No, it actually became restricted because it was hazardous to forests. Pine tar production demands resin-rich pine and uh, whole stands of slow-growing timber were harvested just to feed the tar pits. Medieval and early modern governments saw their naval strength threatened by this kind of resource depletion. This right here is where strategy, economy and warfare all collide. 
In regions that depended on shipbuilding, the state, well, they stepped in. England and France, for instance, began regulating tar makers. Certain forests were placed under strategic protection, and in fact some areas even banned private tar production entirely. Up in the north, resin-rich pine became tightly controlled because naval fleets, those lifelines of trade and power, needed it far more than villagers did. As time moved forward, environmental regulations, you know, tightened again. Some types of pine tar, especially those produced from incomplete burns, were discouraged or even banned from certain industrial uses. Not because the technique was outdated, but really because it was too effective, too widely adopted, just too tempting for anyone who wanted long-lasting wood in a world that didn't seem to have any limits. So, how do you apply this medieval powerhouse method today in a practical and well-controlled way? Modern survivalists, woodworkers and homesteaders still use variations of this technique. You can actually recreate the method safely and responsibly using widely available materials. Here's the real, hands-on approach. Start with dry wood. Hardwood or pine, both work, honestly. Apply a light, even char. Not burning, mind you. Just blackening the outer layer until the surface hardens. A propane torch works beautifully, but even campfire embers give you the same medieval effect. Wipe off the loose soot. Now your wood is opened and ready. Heat natural pine tar or a tar linseed oil blend until it becomes smooth and spreadable. Medieval artisans use clay pots. You can use a small metal can in hot water. When the wood is still warm, brush the tar deeply into the surface. Let it sit. Let it cure. Many repeat the process for a second coat. The result is wood that, well, laughs at weather. Fence posts last longer. Tool handles resist cracking from extreme winters or brutal summers. Walking staffs, stakes, traps, outdoor gear, everything becomes tougher, more reliable, more old-world resilient. And here's the key takeaway. This process works because it mirrors nature's own chemistry. No synthetic preservatives, no industrial shortcuts, just heat, resin, and an understanding of how wood breathes. Why this forgotten method still matters for history lovers and survivalists today? This isn't just a woodworking trick. It's a window into the medieval engineering mindset, a world where people didn't have disposable tools or endless resources. They had to make their materials endure. They had to observe how moisture moves through wood, how fungi invade, how insects sense weakness. And somehow, without laboratories or textbooks, they solve problems with a clarity we still admire. Modern bushcrafters appreciate this method not because it's nostalgic, but because it flat-out works. Off-grid builders appreciate it because it requires zero factory-made chemicals. Historians appreciate it because it shows the bridge between survival and craftsmanship. And anyone who has ever swung an axe or built a fence can appreciate the brilliance behind it. If this kind of deep dive into forgotten tech fires you up, then stick around. Subscribe to History HQ, share this piece with fellow enthusiasts, and help revive the knowledge that built the world long before modern convenience.